when people think about the term virtual reality, um, they typically think about video games, right? They think about, you know, you go into an arcade and you play a Jurassic Park video game where you get to drive away from dinosaurs. They might think of a space museum in which you can use virtual reality to see what it'd be like to travel to the stars. People who are a little bit more deeper into the field, they might know the research that you've people you know people have been doing about virtual reality and how it's going to help people cope with PTSD. So the term virtual reality was coined by Jaron Lanier. Um, he's a he's a he's a he's a tech I would I would say a tech philosopher. Um, he's a coder, he's just a really brilliant dude. I suggest read all his books, look at his videos and things like that. And so when we think about human history Technological, the technological advances that have been happening have been happening at a very blistering pace. So when the phone service was first uh, built, it actually was a service only for elite families in eastern cities. Thinking about now, you know, how could people back then even imagine that today the average person would have a computer in their pocket, right? So technology, you know, technology kind of happens at a blistering speed. And so when we're thinking about you know, VR, we really need to think about its potential for to, you know, to become a kind of everyday occurrence in our lives. And so typically the areas that happens in is shopping, right? So shopping and customer service. So that's why I wanted to talk about virtual reality in customer service. And so while right now virtual reality is still, you know, it's somewhat still of a luxury tech um, there have been estimates that in the year 2020, about 14 billion sales and softwares will happen in the realm of virtual reality. So it's, it's coming. It's not something that's even, you know, a distant future. It's just a couple years from now, and we're really going to start seeing it move into the kind of commercial space. And so there's already some examples of uh, virtual reality that's um, already out there. So Ikea actually has a virtual store. Alibaba, which is the, 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 the Chinese version of Amazon, they have a virtual reality store. Samsung and Audi actually combined to do a uh, virtual reality where you can test drive their cars. Um, so, you know, these things are coming in. The benefits of virtual reality are somewhat self-evident, right? And that kind of goes with all technology. Um, the benefits of technology is not exactly a hard sell. It's more, you know, um, you know, take my money now. When we think about the benefits of VR in the customer service realm, you know, people could, for example, try on clothes without leaving their house. People could see the dimensions of a, spe a specific product. So let's just say you were purchasing a bed, right? You could see the dimensions of the bed and then map it to the room in your house. That saves you a lot of time. It saves you a lot of measuring, right? You, and it saves you, you know, if you forgot to measure and you go to the store and they say, okay, how big is your, you know, your room? You can't, you know, you're going to be like, oh, well, you know, it's the bed. The door is kind of this big and the room is kind of this big. You know, it's, it's more precise if you can do it and measure it out with virtual reality. And, you know, again, the, the, the benefits of these things are really, you know, really self-evident. But um, through the talk, I wanted us to also think about the drawbacks. And so one of the things that tech critics have often, you know, tried to um, bring into the public consciousness is while we're trying to, we're in this race for convenience, we're in this race to make things fact, you know, faster, quicker, easier, we often forget some of the, the ethical questions that we should ask about technology. Technology in and of itself has a disruptive element, and that disruptive element is not always you know, positive, sometimes it has negative effects. Virtuality can change culture uh, for the better, but it also can augment some of the, the not so good things in culture that are already exist. In order to show this, I wanted us to kind of do a thought experiment. We have a, a, a customer service worker, his name is Mark, and Mark works for a company and they do virtual reality in their customer service. Mark uses an avatar in his face-to-face -face, uh, conversations with people he's talking to. An avatar is a, the digital representation of someone, so I, I guess the, the, the easiest proxy uh, for an avatar for people who've ever played video games is the character you're moving on the board, right? That would be the avatar. Um, but in virtual reality, the person probably look you know, a little bit more actual, more real. And so in real life, uh, Mark is a young African-American male, and in real life he has dreads. And he asks his boss, you know, um, at the same uh, mattress store that you guys went to earlier, 
Um, he asks his boss, can I keep my dreads and my avatar? And his boss says, no. His boss says, you know, in real life, you can keep your dreads, but in terms of your virtual uh, representation, you need to cut off your dreads. You need to have a, a more, um, you know, and I'm sure they can kind of dress up the language, but they'll probably say a more presentable um, image, right? So what is Mark supposed to do? What is, who, who, who is Mark supposed to, you know, uh, air his grievances to? Is this an issue of freedom of expression, right? Does Mark have the right to portray himself, his, you know, you portray his digital representation in the way that he sees fit? Or is that more of a kind of a private company policy? Is that more of the company has the right to control the digital representation of its workers? Even though this might seem, you know, like a far-fetched situation, um, this already has happened in real life. And so in the 11 U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, they've actually ruled that companies can discriminate against dreadlocks. So that's already something that's happened in real life. And so how does that manifest itself in the, the digital space? And again, that's already, you know, that's a, that's a kind of a heated debate that would be happening if, you know, in the case of Mark, that were actually to happen. But we can think of even, you know, more kind of heated issues where that might be prevalent. So, for example, let's say you are a woman and naturally your hair is black or brunette or maybe a dark brown. And let's say your boss says your avatar in, in order to, you know, work here, your avatar needs to be a blonde because we've done, you know, research and it says that people just like buying stuff from blondes more than they do people who are brunette. What if you are a Muslim or a Sikh worker and your employer says that you cannot wear your head, car your, your head uh, you know, your traditional head scarves in the virtual world, you know, what do you do? What if you are an overweight worker and your employer says that in the digital space you need to present yourself as physically, you know, conventionally fit? And then we can also think about how this combines in different parts of the media ecology, right? And so let's say, um, I, I know some of you might be privy to it, but there's been a lot of technological advances in terms of translating, so you can just kind of speak into your phone and what comes out at the other end is a different language. So, you know, you go to China, you don't know how to speak Chinese, you speak to your phone, it speaks perfect Chinese. And so let's kind of combine those two ideas with the virtual reality and the translator. So you're a Dalit woman, you're, a, you're living in an impoverished area in India, and you're working for a outsourcing company. The VR uh, simulator that you're um, your company is using, they also have a language uh, translator. In real life, this Dalit woman is presented as, you know, someone who looks like Marilyn Monroe. But on your end, you wouldn't know that, right? And so again, we're just kind of thinking about how these things can kind of combine to augment some of the, the biases in society. And so I just wanted to bring that up as to, to caution people. Um, in my media literacy classes, um, we talk about the idea of techno-fundamentalism. So techno-fundamentalism is just kind of this idea that everything can be solved with technology, that if we just make more technology, the world would be better. And there's some ways that that makes sense, right? There's historians have done a lot of studies and, you know, if we think about an era such as the civil rights era, for example, a lot of historians suggest that it actually could not have happened if we didn't have television. And so again, Technology is, it is changing culture in a way, it is helping society in more beneficial ways. Um, but it also can be you know, disruptive of society in some ways that we might not be able to see if we're just blinded for the benefits. And so I just wanted to leave you with that thought experiment and hope you guys have a good day.